Welcome everybody. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our panel and workshop combo event, the online medium strategies for climate justice activism in the age of social media, um, which will be the first event of SketCon 2021, Our World, Our Time, Our Voices. My name is Leonella and I'm one of your moderators today along with my fellow SCEC member, Kiana. Um, and today our panelists will be discussing modern social media activism for a variety of topics that encompass environmental and climate justice. This event is hosted by the Students of Color Environmental Collective at UC Berkeley as a part of SCECON 2021, an environmental justice centered conference hosted by students of color for students of color. This conference is funded by the Green Initiative Fund and our theme this semester is Our World, Our Time, Our Voices as we aim to recenter the environmental narrative around environmental justice by giving intentional space for students of color to learn about unique and intersectional environmental topics and share our own view of environmentalism. Our conference is focused on demo, 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 democratizing um, environmental education through engaging panels and both individual and community-based activism workshops. I'll pass to Thank Kiana. you, Leo. Today we'll begin with a one-hour panel discussion followed by a 30-minute workshop. Leonella and I will be moderating and asking questions until 12.45 p.m. PST, which is when we'll move to audience questions. You can submit questions to our panelists through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Our panel will close out at 1 p.m. and we'll move right into our workshop, hosted by Isaiah Hernandez of At Queer Brown Vegan, who will be teaching you how to make an engaging and informative social media graphic from start to finish. We would like to give a huge thanks to all of the panelists to take, that have taken their time to join us today and share their experiences and stories. Before we start, we want to acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchen, the land of Chechenya speaking Ohlone people. As members of the Berkeley community, we continue to benefit from the usage of this stolen land. The hashtag land back movement makes it imperative that we better understand the history of this land and that the members of the Muakma Ohlone are still present within the Berkeley community. We will now play a land acknowledgement video from the Sagorote Land Trust before jumping into our panel. Good day, my name is Karina Gould and I am the spokesperson and travel chair for the Confederated Villages of Lashan. Today we sit at UC Berkeley, one of the traditional homelands of our territory. UC Berkeley sits on Huchin territory, a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time. Huchin encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Alameda, Berkeley, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. We welcome you today to be a part of this wonderful conversation. We hope that your eyes and ears and heart opens up to new and amazing possibilities. We thank you for our time. We ask that you work with the Confederated Villages of Lashan to create reciprocity and awareness throughout our territories. Thank you so much to the Segurite Land Trust for that video. Now to introduce the panelists. Deandra Marizet is a conscious curator, community builder, writer, and founding member of Intersectional Environmentalist. Deandra uses her work to elevate intersectional sustainability through the lens of social media and culture. With a background in fashion and community building, Deandra uses her studies to unpack the importance of ecofeminism and cultural preservation. Now, Deandra spearheads business and resource development for intersectional environmentalists. Our next panelist is Aditi Mayer. She's a sustainable fashion blogger behind AddieMay.com, photojournalist, labor rights activist, and frequent speaker on topics of social and environmental justice. Her work looks at fashion and culture through a lens of intersectionality and decolonization. She also serves on the Council of Intersectional Environmentalists and will be spending 2022 as a National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellow, spending one year documenting the social and environmental impacts of India's fashion supply chain. Hi, Celine. Um, Celine Saman is a Le Lebanese Canadian designer, advocate, writer, and founder of Slow Factory Foundation. She works at the intersections of human rights and environmental justice. Sorry, I lost my place. Environmental justice is one of the council, is on the Council of Progressive International, became a director's fellow, M Director's Fellow of MIT Media Lab in 2016 and served on the board of directors of AIGA New York. 
a nonprofit designer organization. We are really excited to have you here with us today. Let's start by getting to know a little bit about you. Can you give us some more background to who you are and what experiences brought you to advocating for social and environmental justice? Deandra, we'll start with you. Hey everyone, can we hear me okay? Yes, okay, awesome. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm definitely fangirling, um, being on the same panel as Aditi and Celine. I like cannot believe this is happening. Uh, <laughs> so, hi. I would say as far as starting my journey and kind of what brought me to environmentalism was heavily through social media, which was really cool. Um, you know, millennials, we kind of found our way to so many cool things through social media. And when I first moved to New York and was pursuing a fashion career, um, I didn't have any friends in New York because I was just so new to the area. And I was really passionate about uncovering all things sustainability and fashion. So that's where I found really cool people online to follow like Aditi and Celine and so many other people. And it really opened my eyes to how social media could be just an incredible tool for community building. So I ended up using it to create a really incredible sustainable community, both from a following um, and educational aspirational standpoint, but also just from a, hey, I wanna talk about systems of oppression at brunch, who's willing to do that with me? And so I found all of those people through social media. So that was that was my social media love story. <laughs> Thank you, Aditi, if you'd like to go next. Yes, so I had my start in the space uh, six going on seven years ago. Um, I was just about to start my college career at UC Irvine. And my background was that I love storytelling and photojournalism was my kind of my chosen path. But design, aesthetics and fashion were quickly becoming very powerful mediums for me to explore my identity. Um, at this time is when Rana Plaza factory collapse happened. And this, for those that are not familiar, was an eight story garment factory out of Dhaka, Bangladesh, producing for some of the world's well, most well known fast fashion names. And so when I learned about Rana Plaza, it completely catalyzed a new understanding of fashion, one that was tied to the politics of labor, to the environmental impact of fashion. Um, as a child of the internet does, I started a blog the next night about sustainable fashion, which was quite a younger concept at the time. And the landscape was riddled with white saverism. This was the peak of like Coachella fashion with Vindies and just South Asian fashion appropriation. And so my vantage point really was from my own identity as someone who was the daughters of farmers in Punjab who had lived through the green revolution um, to having you know my grandparents telling me the impacts that colonialism had on land and labor and how that traced to their migration to the US. And so all of these, you know, personal histories and seeing the, the missing parts of the narrative kind of informed my vantage point, which led me to the work that I do today. Thank you. I'm definitely a huge fan of anime and um, just, yeah, love your work so much. Um, Celine. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so sorry I'm late and uh, I think it was right on time. <laughs> I almost missed it. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like I'm a, I'm a bit of a young elder here in the in the space. Um, definitely have been doing this since I was um, 13 years old and uh, I was born in Lebanon uh, uh, during a war. So I'm a first generation war survivor. And during the war, we've uh, experienced a lot of, of course, destruction, but also through the lens of um, uh, the, the circumstances that were happening. I was also found myself um, as a refugee in North America at a young age and then um, experienced racism in North America and then went back to Lebanon because my parents were like, we can't live here. This is not our land. They returned to Lebanon in the mid 90s where I was a teenager and um, was able to kind of experience the cost the war had on my country, both from an environmental standpoint and from an, uh, a human rights standpoint. And it had or, already um, impacted me before I even knew. Uh, I was also very active in um, the uprising at the time and the, and the demands for liberation from the Syrian army. And I was uh, also very active in politics and um, my family runs a, a, 
a company in fashion. My mom uh, introduced plus size uh, garments to Lebanese women uh, post-war. So I was looking at what she was doing and being very critical of fashion at the same time because I was never a fashionable person. I was very much of a tomboy and also didn't like the way that fashion dictated how we should be and how we must uh, be in fashion out of fashion and all these things, these rules that were ridiculous. And so I started writing a lot about the relationship between, you know, sustainability and colonialism from that vantage point, from um, uh, one that looked at um, how fast fashion had destroyed local economies in Lebanon and from the point of view of a global South person, not necessarily related to the supply chain, but just like from the observation of how fast fashion had impacted culture, had impacted um, our relationship to the land, our relationship to the self. And um, I started talking a lot about fashion and activism, fashion and politics and um, had started a book in the works of fashion and politics, which is now um, still in the works in research phase, but um, also looking at the relationship between the supply chain and the relationship between that and of colonialism and made the conclusion that um, colonialism is not a thing of the past, it's an economic reality, it's related to how things are still shaped up in the way that how um, uh, a global brands can still be benefiting from colonialism and employing at very low cost uh, people from all over the global south, particularly in Southeast Asia, and um, also tracing what the go what happens to the donations when the global north is done with their trends, where do they go? And again, I met so many people along the way in this journey, particularly the OR is present, which is a non for profit that works in Ghana in uh, uh, with this, uh, you know, this second market, as we call it, which is the market of waste, uh, which is the waste that comes from the global north. And, uh, you know, just very curious person in, in general. And so I, I just like to um, inquire and then um, try to create a way so that we can understand what's going on, so that we can impact it and then ideally work um, with people from within the, these brands. So of course, activism has a certain limit at a certain point when we're screaming outside on the street, it's beautiful. But what happens after that, we need to be able to work across uh, these boundaries and these, uh, um, yeah, these boundaries essentially of values and being able to work within these industries and within the industry with the sea level suite in changing the way that the supply chain is being affected currently um, and, and just, I'm, I'm curious about how can we do this? Thank you so much, Celine. Um, I, a little bit about me, I am, uh, I was born in Iran and um, I am an immigrant um, and I appreciate so very much you and your posts every single day and resonate so very much with everything that you say. So um, thank you. I will pass it to Leah for our next question. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Kiana, and thank you, everybody. Um, the next question is, what led you to use social media as a tool for activism, and how has it positively impacted your work? But at the same time, we recognize that social media algorithms and corporations are oppressive and even dangerous. So we would love to hear about the pros and cons that you've experienced in your time online. And Aditi, do you want to start us off with this one? Sure, 100%. So as I said, when I first entered the realm of the sustainable fashion conversation, um, you know, shortly thereafter, I had an internship at a local ethical fashion brand that was employing women in India. Um, and a lot of the narratives that I was seeing immediately caused a lot of um, discomfort for me. There was this um, false dichotomy that was like the global north and the global south, but the visual imagery that kind of aided this narrative was well-off white women in the global north that were saving black and brown women in the global south that were only showcased in conjunction to their labor. Um, we saw a lot of nameless humans and this poverty porn was ubiquitous. And I think that really informed what I wanted to challenge. And so bringing those perspectives on social media was kind of my way of countering a narrative that I wasn't seeing in terms of the power dynamics that plagued the industry at the time. And the other part of it was the narrative that sustainability was a movement that you could participate in if you had the means to buy into it. And as someone that came from a low income background, 
sustainability was a cultural norm, but also an economic necessity. And I felt like, is there a room for me in this movement if I can't afford these things? And so, you know, social media became the medium to articulate those feelings. And I think the power of social media was finding a community at that time that was echoing those sentiments uh, and pushing that narrative forward. Um, you mentioned the cons of social media. And I would say what I've seen at that time and what I've seen evolve is that so much of the nature of social media is a knee-jerk reaction or a response. That's what the Twitters and Facebook profit off of, right? This, whether it's fear or anger, which is all valid. But I think what I am still kind of grappling it with is how do we kind of make space for historical context of the patience of learning, complexity, and nuance, and how that is, you know, can't necessarily be captured through the domain of social media. Um, and I think the other thing is we're all imperfect humans that are learning out loud in public. And so it's really interesting for me to think about the idea of the personal brand, of the branding of self, right? We put ourselves on a pedestal, we put other people on a pedestal, and so much of it is tied to the reduction of personhood to like a bio. And so I think that's something I'm thinking about a lot is how do we kind of hold space and grace to see people in their full humanity rather than folks that are always expected to have the answers. Um, so those are just some initial thoughts of how it's been a very powerful space of building community, but I also think it flat, I think it's uh, Mimi is a really powerful creator who recently posted something along the lines of social media flattens the spirit. And I think that's something we really do uh, unpack and how do we have space for nuance and mental health and authentic community building when it's reduced to pixels on the screen. Yeah, thank you, DT, for starting to unpack that nuance for us. Um, I'm wondering if Celine would like to talk a bit about her experiences next, especially because um, as somebody who's a huge fan of your own personal accounts and so factory, I know you've talked a bit about being shadow banned as well on social media. Um, and I think that's a huge con of it as well. So I um, would love to hear about your experiences, Celine. For sure. So um, I'm, I consider myself web native, which means like from the early 1990s, listening to the modem being like tuned into your phone, your telephone and ding, 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 like that, that era is very much where I come from. And so being online has always been a, a very big uh, liberation for me, especially from Beirut. And um, I uh, then uh, kind of learned um how to design uh, just on by working. And so it was the early ages of information architecture, user experience design, web design. So the early 2000s where I my career started and um, very soon I became part of Creative Commons, which is, are you guys familiar with Creative Commons? Creative Commons, it's um, uh, an open license. Basically, it re it's the, the gray area between copyright and public domain. And so as people started sharing their thoughts and knowledge online, their music, their art, everything, um, there needed to be some kind of license that was able to capture and to protect the, the original work of certain uh, of the creators that created it. And Creative Commons came to be, and it's uh, I was uh, uh, you know uh, helping Creative Commons reach the, the the creators, the artists, the writers, the the musicians, so that they could post their work online under this new license. And there are several licenses that allow or not creative, um, uh, not creative, but uh, capital gain on someone else's work, like commercial use, and so. I, I just like to preface with that because with the work of uh, being online, there comes the responsibility of uh, tracing your sources of uh, attribution, attributing where your work comes from. And, um, and so I think that with uh, everything that's going now, uh, going on online now with everything that's going viral and a lot of accounts of, are, are kind of uh, emerging in, in, in this digital space. I feel like it's important to just remind that, you know, the open web is something very, very powerful. Of course, nothing is original. Everything is a remix. But at the end of the day, it's important to trace back and to write our sources and to attribute and to create a link between one another because otherwise we are erasing each other. And so I just wanted to preface with that because that's also where shadow banning comes in. Shadow banning is uh, particular to a specific app. You're not shadow banned on all of the apps. If you're posting things online on the web, on the open web, you're not shadow banned. You're posting whatever you want. But within the confines of uh, Instagram, 
there needs to be uh, a way for us to look at what are the ethics of the of uh, of of this digital space. What are the digital ethics? How how are we able to uh, combat this shadow banning? Whether we're saying the word Palestine or we're saying the word Lebanon or we're saying Beirut explosion or anything like that, we may be shadow banned or even Black Lives Matter. Um, a lot of Black creators are being shadow banned as well. And what does that mean? It means that your content is not being shown on um, the hashtags that you're that you're using or it's not being shown in your in your peers um, uh, feed it's being buried down a lot of times i'm hearing that people can't even like the posts that we're posting you have to like a several times so that it actually records the the, the that you liked it <laughs> you know and so um, that's why online now um, on, on Instagram, uh, we kind of started creating this uh, group of influencers, like a private DM group that I think intersectional environmentalism is part of. And that started with the need that a bunch of us, Impact, Slow Factory, should, you should care about, feminist, a bunch of us came together and were like, oh my gosh, our posts are not being seen by anyone, despite the fact that some of us have millions of followers, what's going on? So we created this DM and then we started just promoting and helping one another, which brings me back to the first point, which is like creating a connection between each other, not erasing one another and being able to trace back our sources, attribution of our work and being able to support one another in a way that's uh, building the, the community that is created and uh, that was already created or that was already there. And so building a sort of a, of a link between each other so that we combat the shadow banning. Beautiful, thank you, Celine. Um, and yeah, I'll pass to Deandra next, who also has an amazing Instagram, social media presence that I'm obsessed with. So I would love to hear your experiences next. Yeah, that was so amazing, both of you, Aditi, Celine, that was so great. And I love, you know, the idea of creating a link, like you mentioned, Celine, I think that that was something that I tried to really use my social media platform for in the beginning. So this might, might actually answer the first question more in depth that leads me to the second question, but my journey into sustainability ended up being one that prefaced my time in the fashion industry. Not to say that this can't happen after you enter, but I, I ended up entering at a point where I already knew the connections, a lot of deep connections, a lot of seeds had already been planted for me with regards to how carelessly people hold this phrase of protecting people on the planet. Uh, and what little consideration the people aspect of that had gotten in this mainstream conversation that was happening. So I entered the fashion industry with that. And what I saw happening on social media was a lot of good, and a lot of bad. And I think that having had such a small platform that was predominantly used solely to connect me with people IRL, I was able to build a lot of really cool coalition with community members that were ready to have wine nights to talk about cultural appropriation, ready to have dinners to talk about, you know, fair trade and what that really meant to the mainstream, but what it meant to grassroots efforts and what the differences were between that. So I think that that was really a lot of the good that came from social media. So I was able to find people and really start building community in that way. But because I wanted to infiltrate that this surface level conversation, if you will, that I felt was being had on social in social media or within the ecosystem of social media at the time, I wanted to be able to create more of those links, like you said, Celine, at least in the small capacity that, that I could at the time. And so I started creating these digital downloads. I started a blog that was essentially, you know, not doing anything astronomical that, that anyone else hadn't already been doing. I just called them digital downloads because it sounded cool. And I was like, all right. And I just honed in on some topics that I was particularly passionate about, which is I, I think where anyone should start, right? Hone in on a couple topics that you're particularly passionate about. I just curated resources that I felt went beyond the infographic. Resources that I felt did a good job of connecting people and the planet? What does it mean to, additionally, what does it mean to nudge someone who has only been exposed to a 
more planet friendly uh, narrative than a true people on the planet holistic narrative. What does it mean to curate information that validates what they already know and encourages them to take it a step further. So I started creating these digital downloads around just a few topics. Um, and that I think helped to position me in a place where, okay, I'm able to have this relationship that I have with social media that I can appreciate. I appreciate the good that can come from the learning by way of scrolling. There's this, I think that there's this nature of social media today and there's obviously a sense of urgency that we can have around certain issues. And there's so much importance uh, around disseminating information. But I think that, and this kind of ties back to Aditi, what you were saying earlier, we end up honing in on people and artists that can deliver a quick and eloquent message a succinct and digestible message. And in the age of you know, live interviews and media graphics, that makes complete sense. So don't get me wrong, having a disposition that allows you to deliver that or achieve that is so, so wonderful and so needed. But my concern at that time, and still, and still is for, for sure, is that education by way of scrolling doesn't really help us build coalition beyond a surface level conversation, which is what I was trying to combat with these digital downloads. So in the journeys of our own advocacy, we can't only prioritize people who can deliver these quick messages, or I will add, circling back to what Aditi said, we can't prioritize the versions of people that set them up to deliver quick messages and quick messages alone when they actually have much more to say. So we have filmmakers, we have writers, we have painters, so many artists in the movement that are creating in such a way that is meant to create pause and not allow you to just keep scrolling. So I think for me, the responsibility, and you touched on this a little bit, Celine, as well, that the sense of responsibility that I personally feel when I was creating digital downloads for 20 of my friends. And now when we create content for all the people that follow us on IE, yes, there is a sense of urgency in the immediate post, but where is it taking people after? Where is the people who are passionate about that topic, are we giving them what they need to, to keep going, to listen to the artists that are creating the pause after and creating all those links so that we can send someone down their journey? The concept, the original concept of a digital download was to remove myself from the information and say, hey, here's something I'm passionate about. Here are all these people after the curation of information that I think will take you to a good place as a starting point. Here are all the people in addition to the people who created those resources that can take you down that journey because I'm not the person that can take you down that journey. And compiling that and creating an ecosystem of that, creating all those links is I think what led the digital downloads to becoming in part what IE is today and what plenty of platforms are. I mean, so many of our platforms do that in such a beautiful way. That, that's it, sorry, get off my TED talk here. <laughs> that gave me goosebumps, thank you. <laughs> um, so we wanted to ask about um, some of the strategies that you've picked up along the way that make your informational posts like you were just talking about, um, so successful and engaging? And uh, what are the best ways to get information to a lot of people in this accessible way? Um, I mean, Celine, the Slow Factory does such a great job of this. So um, I would love to hear a little bit about that. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> so um, the strategies of, uh, of, of making informational posts, you mean? So, you know, um, the Slow Factory started as a product company almost 10 years ago, and we worked with NASA Images. Um, and again, my background, again, it's just because it was from Creative Commons, NASA had joined Creative Commons, and I was like, oh my God, this is open data. People need to access this data. How can we make this data accessible to people? How can we translate what's going on behind the scenes? Uh, how can we democratize science? And that was always part of the work that I was doing with Creative Commons and also part of my uh, career, which is around uh, information uh, architecture, which is basically like building the websites that people use. I worked particularly with uh, government and translating complex information for the public. And so how do we make 
things accessible. And so that's from where I come from in the work uh, that I do with Slow Factory in the evolution from the product to what the platform it is now. And when we work on complex and uh, complex topics, um, maybe it's like uh, COVID-19 or maybe it's like um, even the work that I was doing prior to that uh, in tracing the supply chains was also how do we present this information? How do we talk about it in a way where we're not alienating anybody, we're kind of inviting people into this information. It could be a slogan, it could be a quote, it could be an article. There's different ways. And I think like you guys also know this better than me because you're you're um, the generation that is uh, even more in, in tune with this social media and um, with TikTok, for example, for me, TikTok, my kids play with TikTok and I'm like so fascinated with TikTok. I think it's an amazing platform. It's fascinating. I, I, I understand the, <laughs> how, how sticky it is, you know, like you start with one and you're just on it for a long, long time. Um, and also it, it, it brings the barrier super low to entry in, in terms of like creating, creating something that doesn't need to be super glossy and well produced. It's very cool that it's accessible. It's like actually low, uh, low res, you know, it's like low resolution. It's super easy to do. You, you put this crazy bag, like the transparent background behind you and then you have information behind you, it's kind of super cool. And I think that that's what is interesting to me. It's how can we lower the barrier of entry for information, make information accessible, but also not dumbing it down. So it's a very difficult thing to do, right? So how do you make it accessible, but you're not um, paraphrasing, you're not doing plagiarism, you're not simplifying it to a point where you're alienating or erasing certain groups of people. It's, it's a delicate balance that um, we're all agreeing to play for us to create something that's digestible as you scroll. So it's, it's also very depressing when we are behind the scenes because we're like, oh, like this is so deep and important. Where is nuance? Why, how can we have a long conversation of an hour where there's no, ne no conclusion necessarily, but where we have a conversation, you know? And I think that you know, of course, there's a lie for that, maybe if 20 people show up, but like, there's a, that's why we started doing open education. That's why we started to, to develop on what we were doing in terms of um, a deeper um, engagement with people. Uh, we, we didn't think of it this way. Actually, a friend of mine was um, challenging me during quarantine and she's like, Celine, you have to do a class online. I'm like, oh my God, no. And she forced me to announce it on Monday. I had to scramble, figure it out for Friday. That's how sustainability literacy started. And I was like, maybe like 40 friends will show up. It's going to be perfect. I bought a Zoom account where I can have maybe like 50 people. It was already very expensive. I wanted to keep it very free. And then uh, we had 1000 students in the first class. So we had to upgrade. Then I started asking for donations. I was like, okay, so <laughs> help me pay for Zoom. Then I was like, maybe Zoom wants to sponsor. I don't have a contact at Zoom, but if you have a contact at Zoom, please. Um, anyway, and um, so that's how Open EDU began. It began with sustainability literacy. She was like, just put together what you always talk about and everyone doesn't wanna hear you anymore in any dinner ever. Um, so Deandra, we gotta go for dinner because and invite Aditi and every one of you because I like to talk about these things all the time. But okay, again, my friends were like, please just do one class and get it out of your system. So that's how Open EDU began. And then um, and then I, I developed on that. Then after that, I was like, oh my gosh, I have so many peers I need to ask to participate. And so I think like we like to get out of social media as soon as possible. So that's us. Um, social media is like a tenth of what we do. We don't do social media daily. We don't even have a big team to do social media. We're literally three people behind the scenes and including myself, my team, Yasmin and Colin. And now we have Truman, Sarah Raiden, of course, but no one is full time on social media. Like social media is an hour a week where we're like, what do we do? And then of course my team works on it and it's several hours, but of building those posts, but it's not like we, we don't do that full time. I wish we had a bigger team. Um, we need your tips. Um, no, we do work. Uh, uh, for example, today we posted a post about fast fashion that took uh, our team 
maybe like 10 hours to build this week but we have other projects so this this post was cool but like we we do one like this a week this is what i'm trying to say it, i wish we had a bigger team but this comes down to funding and we are guerrilla funded i have to be transparent we are a non for profit super guerrilla funded um, funded by the public monthly and funded by brands that we managed to convince that they will have no branded posts on, on our grid and we will not talk about their products and we will not sell for them. And some of them accept, but it's very, very rare. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave it to others. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it's so, it, it's incredible to know that, you know, what goes behind making those posts because they're so good and so informational. And um, Deandra, I know we make a lot of similar posts at IE um, and we also think a lot about those nuances and how do we make sure that all of that information is captured within those. So I would love to hear about um, what you think about this question as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so many great points made. And I think that for me, it, even in the early days of my digital download blog, I, I think that where I found a lot of frustration with the scroll in addition to obviously it kind of staying at this very surface level place was that a lot of people were, and not to say that this is a bad thing. I don't think this is a bad thing to do. I just wanted something additional. I saw a lot of people curating captions or posts with information that lacked some type of point of view. I think it's okay to say, 10 ways to, right? Like those are helpful, right? That they're helpful. I love those. I'm here for them. But when it came to breaking down an issue, sometimes you can walk away from a quote unquote objective post and not really know how to feel or what to think because you're not there yet. So you take that information for what it is and you don't really know what to make of it. So if you do come from a place where you've had an opportunity to break down an issue and develop some type of point of view around what this means for the wider issue and being transparent about what you're still learning. I mean, Aditi, you made a great point earlier. We're all just live, you know, sharing our journeys. It's okay to be transparent about what you don't know, but if you come from an environmental studies background, if you come from the fashion industry, if you come from the agriculture industry, it's okay to not be objective. There, there's a, I think that some people hold this virtue in being objective. And I, and I think that it, we're, it's a little late in the game for that. Like people's lives are on the line. So I think that it's important in some instances to help people get to where they need to go from a social media standpoint. This was kind of that tip that I started developing along the way for myself was, okay, maybe my point of view isn't astronomical, but it's one step beyond the objective. And that's gonna help somebody get, get one step further along with me. And I think that that's an important way to start your journey. And it's a way to constantly um, help yourself continue to grow as well, because you're only going to invite, not you're going to challenge yourself to develop a point of view, but then you'll invite others to challenge your point of view. And that's where you start to grow and build community. And I think it's the best way to, you know, tackle problems and have meaningful conversations. Aditi, I think you're a one woman show and you create these beautiful <laughs> designs and you like put all of this research in and it's honestly like so admirable to see like everything that you do. So we'll pass it on to you. Yeah, I actually would love to build on what Deandra was saying about the idea of objectivity and content because it's coming from a journalistic background. I think it's really interesting. Um, I went to a for university, I studied literary journalism and it was a very white program in terms of the faculty and the things we read. And I remember always being like, your idea of objectivity is just historically white man subjectivity. And um, it reminds me of um, an article that my friend Camille Shane, that a lot of you might follow, posted the other day about the idea of credibility in media. And I think that's worth unpacking here. Um, you know, we, we focus so much on objectivity and neutrality, but I think that those are those are domains and terms that were largely created to undermine a lot of communities whose lived experience and stakes were tied to these issues. Um, and she writes about knowing the person's vantage point and identity as a point to connect to them 
And when that is explicit, we have more ability to kind of take all of that information, not necessarily with a grain of salt, but to know the optics at which they're operating in. And I think that's the really powerful part of social media. You know, I started my blog and I guess social media work while I was literally starting college. And I remember the tension I felt with my professors that would see that and be like, oh, you're too opinionated, or this makes you an activist, or this undermines your work as a journalist. And I, it was a, was a point of tension, but I think I've come to learn that if I'm able to be just transparent of who I am, the identities that inform my work, that is actually a plus point in my perspective. Um, sorry, someone knocked on my door and I got caught off track. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's really important. I think as the media world goes on, we're kind of transitioning from a focus on objectivity, objectivity to the politics of transparency. And I think that's very important to do. Um, so those are my thoughts there. But going back to the question of like some strategies that I have picked up along the way, going back to the idea of the attention economy um, and my background as a visual storyteller, there's a lot of powerful, there's a lot of power in graphics. And for me, as someone that focuses on fashion, fashion has always been written off as frivolous. But I think reclaiming um, the power of art and fashion and the visual economy is really powerful. And I think the direction that social media content is going towards with all of these you know, carousel presentations is a reflection of that. Um, so it's kind of like embodying the role of art and visuals in any movement and education is really important at this point in time as well. Thank you all for those lovely, lovely answers to our questions. Um, we're gonna be moving into some audience Q&A right now. So if anybody in the audience right now has any questions, feel free to type those in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start with this question from Sachi. Um, she or they wrote, um, how do you balance social media activism so that it is sustainable to you as individuals? I find the useful, I find the useful democratized information and shared of ideas is canceled out by the saturation of pain and trauma that comes with it. And I think Kian and I were also kind of thinking about this as well, like how you balance your own mental um, health and well-being with spending so much time um, online that um, can be a little toxic at times. Um, Celine, would you like to go first? Um. I don't have an I don't have an advice, but I also suffer from having to respond in real time into certain things that are very traumatic. For example, a few days ago was the seventh month um, anniversary, I guess, of the of the explosion in Beirut, and we were so triggered because my team is uh, Middle Eastern mostly. We were so so triggered, and we were very drained. And we I was like, we have to do something, and you know, I wrote something about it. And then I, uh, but we, you know, we are managing our own trauma and pain constantly. Uh, also, some of my team is um, Black American, Aitian, and also whenever there's a Black Lives Matter issue, we try not to push it on the Black folks in our team, but to take it on and 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 just to to share the trauma as much as possible, um, if it's possible. Uh, so our, you know, Black peers are not the ones having to deal with Black Lives Matter issues. Um, and similarly, with our issues, like we pushed it on someone else to be like, please copy edit this or help us write it. Um, although Yasmin ended up writing the whole thing. Shout out to Yasmin. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so um, how do we do it? Uh, of course, like we can't respond to everything that's going on because the world is going through a major, major crisis on so many layers. And it's impossible to just be like shouting out things. Uh, I was that person, you know, like 10 years ago on uh, even more than 10 years ago, maybe as soon as I joined Facebook, which I reluctantly did, I was like the one sharing all the petitions and saying the world is falling apart and this and that. No one liked me. And um, and no one engaged and so it's always a balance between like what do we say that um enhances the the connection between the issue and the like it is it building empathy or is it building fear okay how are we engaging and i quickly learned that what i was doing was building fear like i was just building fear 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 i was like the fear <laughs> agent in people's feeds and then i started building from that point on which, which helped me engage in uh, Slow Factory in the early ages when I started working with Gaza and refugees in, refugee camps in Lebanon, 
refugee camps in, uh, in, in, in Palestine, working with non-for-profits on the ground. How do I, how am I going to engage? And also I started working very early on with, um, against trauma porn, just because this was how I was being portrayed as like a person from a war zone. But also I understood very quickly that this was like white saviorism and how people were starting to capitalize on, on certain countries. And again, we experienced that during the, the blast in Lebanon on August 4th, where a lot of uh, non-for-profits, international non-for-profits that don't even care about us started to post an image of the, of the explosion. And then they had ads on, uh, that was an ad, the image of the explosion. And it's so triggering because it's just like so much violence and they were getting millions of donations where we struggled to get a hundred thousand to support the peers that we knew. Anyway, so, finding balance, understanding who you're donating to is important. And being able to identify uh, trauma porn, you know, even in the fashion industry, even in any, like any human rights uh, industry, there's, uh, there are ethics that we need to understand before we engage in like calling ourselves, a, you know, a, 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 an activist. So for example, after 2016, there was a rise in activism uh, across the board, okay? Everybody was a, an activist, which is cool. But then uh, before 2016, it was not good to be an activist, just FYI. And then after 2016, it's good to be an activist. And so everyone was like posting left and right things that eventually they ended up taking down or being apologetic about it and things like that. So. It's, it's, it's interesting. I'm just interested in the ethics around it. I'm, I'm curious about what is um, effective, what's leading to an actual change, uh, because you can get so many likes on an image and then nothing converts. And when I use the word converting, I'm not saying buying something, I'm saying converts to doing something. Okay, what is it doing then? You know, you get like tons of likes, let's say, and it's going viral, but nothing is happening you know, at the end of the day. I'm curious, like, how can we move people into action beyond the click? You know, of course, the click is cool already. It's like, okay, something they understand. I'm just curious. I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. Thank you, Celine. Yeah, go ahead, Deandra. Yeah, um, piggyback off of that, because I think that that's definitely like, that is one slice that is so worth considering. And I think that on a more, uh, personal note, I think when you're kind of trying to navigate this idea of protecting your own energy throughout the whole process, um, which Celine, you opened up with so beautifully, you know, that there definitely are a lot of dark places one can take oneself in this work and in the study of it. And I think that for me, it goes, I go back to the idea of responsibility. And I think that it's, it's, you have to define that for yourself and not let other people define it for you. Um, so, you know, if you are a, if you are someone with a huge platform per se, and, and that is objective to subjective to whoever considers you one with a large platform, but you might get a lot of comments from people saying you have a responsibility to blah, 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 blah. And also, why is it always white women that comment that? I don't understand. But anyways, <laughs> but you, it's not about the responsibility that you have from the public's eye. You have a responsibility to your own potential because at the end of the day, there, there is no rule that says we have to be the greatest activists within our own community. We do it because we out here protecting our community because that is the potential of us and our community. Not because a white woman hopped in my comment section and said, I have well, I have like 14,000 followers or something like that. I'm like, get out of here. So I have a responsibility to my own potential. And if I feel called to the responsibility of finessing a digital download, then I'm going to fulfill that and continue to grow in that way. I also feel called to take time for myself because that is fulfilling my potential. So eradicating the notion that sitting on your couch to read a book is lazy or you know removing yourself from the work these past few months in the midst of starting a brand new company and learning about things like taxes and operations and all these things that have me bogged down at my laptop constantly i'm still taking the time to read books that are helping me unpack 
the culture that was stripped of me in a way. And that doesn't feel immediately related, but it is a res that's the responsibility I have to my own potential, even if it's leisurely. So I would say just really defining responsibility and what it means to you and your potential and not what it means to white women in your comment section. <laughs> Yeah, I think you both hit it in the head. I think what I'm really trying to unlearn and kind of interrogate is the pace of information that social media has made us all internalize, how much output we're supposed to do, how much we're supposed to internalize with all this like information and stimuli that we're constantly bombarded with. Um, as far as the question on mental health and social media, I don't think I have an answer either. Um, I think for me, it's this balance of especially being a part of the diaspora, the Indian diaspora at this critical juncture in time with the farmer protests, when you have so many journalists and frontline folks that are being detained and jailed and the trauma that comes about when my own family is out on the front lines, right? There's a lot of stakes there um, and feeling like I need to have all the answers and promote it, but also knowing the very real risks that brings to me and my community. Um, it's something I'm still unpacking. And, you know, I think I'm embracing the idea of taking a step back and making sure I'm calculated and weighing all the risks with anything that I do. And it's hard when the time when there's so many human rights violations and there's so much urgency. But I think this leads me to the idea of cyclical amplification, which Leah Thomas has spoken about, and she like introduced that term to me, that the weight and responsibility doesn't just rely on one person's shoulders, right? And I think that goes back to community. And if we're able to hone in this idea of cyclical amplification, it takes away the burden of feeling like all the labor and responsibility is on one person, especially if they belong to the community and are expected to be the mouthpiece or answerer of all this information. So I think that's something we need to embrace is people kind of um, doing the work and research on their own end and making sure that we see social media as a launching point, not an end all be all, right? Something that I've tried to do is hone in more on doing long form articles and pieces that I could point to if people are, you know, their interest is piqued by a certain post that I do. Um, so I think that's one approach that I have been doing as someone that also has a background in the journalism world. So that's what I found helpful for my own end. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I think we'll ask one last question. And um, I think this, I'll, I'll make it a little bit more general, but um, Sarah is asking, how do you deal with the spelling oriental orientalism and just apathy, apathy from Western followers when you're, when you're advocating for Lebanon, the Levant, and the rest of the Middle East? And I think coming from different backgrounds, I think we can, you can all talk a little bit about that and um, how you bring that, your own backgrounds and cultures and advocating for them to um, your platforms. Um, and it's in the Q&A box if you would like to read a little bit more of it. Uh, and uh, Celine, I guess we'll start with you. If you've had a chance to read it. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to find it. But what is it about Orientalism? It went very fast when you asked it. Let me put it in the chat for you. Yeah, thank you so much. I just, I know there's not that many questions, but I can't find it. <laughs> it's by Sarah Name. Oh, Sarah Name. Piggybacking off of Jana's comment, how do you deal with dispelling Orientalism and just apathy from Western followers? when you're advocating for Lebanon. Uh, I, you know what, just, I wanna say that this week I was on the phone with Sarah Al Afi and we were talking about, she's a, an incredible figure that I would recommend everyone to follow. I'm gonna write her name, Sarah Al Afi. And she is a commentator on the situation in Lebanon and she talks in English, French and Arabic like all Lebanese people do mostly. And she, um, mainly talks in English because she's trying to reach the expats and also people who don't understand what's going on in Lebanon to be able to understand. And her and I had a call this week and I was telling her that just carving up a space in the American media to shine the light on Lebanon has been very difficult for me um, because I am not a, a visible minority. I am not, uh, first, my name is Celine. I talk about that in, in the work that I do around colonialism and why that is. And also, uh, I'm a Christian Arab and I talk also about that and the vast majority, like the, 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 the vastness of diversity of religion. There's 14 different religions in Lebanon that people don't know about, for example. And, uh, and just to, to, to respond to Sarah Nami is that, 
uh, Orientalism, first of all, is a great book. You should read it by Edward Said. But the 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 I, the idea of trying to be a caricature of the of of your identity to fit in the American media is something that I don't want to do, and I don't want to be in a box, and I don't want to have to wear traditional clothes that is so hard to find because of again, colonialism and the cultural erasure that we're going through to be able to fit in a way that America can understand me or to change my name to Alia or to whatever that is. I want to be understood in my complexity and the way that I come in. And I want to talk about Lebanon and the Arab identity and the non-Arab identity that I also have because I don't know if I'm Arab actually big debate in the in Lebanon, Palestine and Syria, we can discuss no one agrees, we don't know it's a, it's a very difficult topic and, um, and that's, that's what I'm interested in and in researching, but it's very complex and complexity in America has very little space. And contradiction in America has even a like a smaller space because America likes something that's who are you, what are you? Yeah, quickly tell me. You are Muslim, you are brown, you are black, you are indigenous. Okay, I can understand you. I'm gonna put you in this BIPOC category, and you are gonna go. And uh, if I have a um, a campaign, you can be the Arab, you can be the Indian. Uh, Deandra, I don't know what your heritage is, but you can be that. And uh, <laughs> it's about that. It's about uh, United Colors of Benetton and uh, representing very quickly, but it's very shallow and it's very optic based. And I had to play some of that game, okay? And um, to get the space, to get a space, to talk about what I want to talk about. But it was very difficult, even in the beginning of my career with Slow Factory, I remember meeting a journalist in Al Jazeera and he was like, Celine, you're so difficult to talk about because your name is Celine, you're not a real Arab. Um, it's hard for me to position you. Do you even identify as Arab? And I was like, oh my God, Ahmed, like, are you fucking serious? Like, just put me on Al Jazeera so I can talk about what I'm doing. But it was so hard. He, even he couldn't find a way for me. And um, yeah, I don't even know how I managed to, to, to get to writing about sustainability and colonialism in the cut. That was the first step. And then I spoke against Marine Serre very publicly about the usage of the Islamic symbol as her logo, which I think is ridiculous. And again, I'm not Muslim, but I come from a, a, um, a land that uh, Islam is my culture, I can claim, okay? Because we are a mi minority over there and there's a majority Muslim and I have a tremendous respect for Islam. So that's where it came from, the, the conversation on using uh, the, 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 the crescent as a logo and etc. Sorry about that, we are going into another topic, but that's Orientalism for you. That's what I don't want to represent. And again, there's so much complexity in our culture that has not yet been exposed to the American public. And I want to talk about that. And I want to talk also about uh, born and raised in America, first generation versus what people called me fresh off the boat, which I take with pride. And I don't want to change my accent. And I, okay, I will be fresh off the boat. And then um, I want to talk about that as well because adopting American values at all costs and thinking American values will be uh, imposed onto everyone else in the world in the world that's also colonialism and that does not work like this even when we talk about race even when we talk about fashion and colonialism all those things so I want to talk about complexity and I want to embrace contradiction and that's where I come from Wow. <laughs> um, like I said, we have an essay due on this tomorrow, so I'm just like taking notes. <laughs> Thank you, Celine. Um, Didi and Aditi, I don't know if you'd like to touch on this quickly. Yeah, I mean, just building off all the brilliance that Celine just said, I think we've definitely normalized and become numb to certain narratives, like Orientalist visions of the world, whether that's violence in the Middle East to garment workers as has seen these victims of predatory capitalism. So I think, you know, especially from my work, looking at labor exploitation always as a distant abstraction is something that I'm always trying to challenge. And I think that goes back to why we need to embrace education that unpacks the histories and structures that set the conditions for these very simplistic notions of the world to exist, right? So something I've been thinking a lot about is, again, 
garment workers in Bangladesh, like, oh, that's where sweatshops exist. This goes back, we have to understand, as Celine said, the histories of colonialism to in the 80s and 90s, when a lot of these countries in the global south were just formally claiming their independence from colonialism. We had the dictator of dictatorship of debt um, in which all of these countries, over 200 countries, we're now in these predatory loans from the IMF and World Bank. And so when it comes to the Bangladeshis of the world, there was structural adjustment done because of this debt that made these zones of economic zones that were tax-free zones, or they were not allowed to unionize, or they had no um, environmental regulation that set the conditions for what they are, right? So it goes back to like, it's one thing to know that you know, this is a hotbed for sweatshops and garment production, but when we don't interrogate the histories and structures that set the conditions for that, we miss the mark. And I think this goes back to why, you know, on social media, the conversation often stops at like sweatshops are bad. How do we unpack that? And how do we do the very radical work of political reimagination, which I think is a lot more easier said than done. I don't have the answers, but it's something I'm challenging myself to do is, how do you reimagine what another world can look like? Um, and it's just something I've been pushing myself to do, reading more books, thinking, uh, and you just reflecting on the work of thinkers, especially that are not a part of the Eurocentric curriculum that we've been fed our whole lives. So that's just my contribution there. <laughs> Go for it, Didi. <laughs> add to that I mean honestly I want to just echo all that was said between Aditi and Celine just now um, and I think that for me it's more so just I think Aditi you hit it right on the head when it comes to reimagining what those conversations are supposed to oops, sorry uh, reimagining what those conversations are supposed to look like and for me in, in the south that very much so it looks like me encouraging people to put a very critical lens on these high level stereotypes between the relationships that the US has with Mexico and what that looks like with regards to folks who work in the agriculture system, folks who, um, or not folks, but the, the drug cartel issue at large and the very important and pivotal roles that the US has played in both of those things. Um, so yeah, just, I think, <laughs> yeah, so just trying to influence again, it's, it's one of those issues that feels so huge and it's how do we reimagine a DT? You asked it, you know, that I ask myself that question all the time, but really trying to encourage people by suggesting that, hey, you understand a stereotype that is perhaps in some instances, one very small puzzle piece. And by leaning on that, honing in on that, it does the issue at large such such disservice. Um, so yeah, I think slowly unpacking, unfortunately, is sometimes the answer because these issues can't be understood in a single social media graphic. Thank you so, so very much. I literally have had goosebumps throughout this entire thing. And it has been such an honor to just speak with you all and have this like all women of color, incredible panel and just, yeah, I just feel very, very connected and grateful that you've put this time to be with us today. Um, unfortunately, that is all the uh, panel time that we have. Um, we're actually going to move into a workshop with um, Isaiah Hernandez, who is a Berkeley and Students of Color Environmental Collective um, alumni. Um, and so panelists, if you'd like any last words, um, the floor is yours. And if you'd like to stick around for Isaiah's um, presentation, please do, but don't feel obliged to. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, everybody. 